We take it for granted that when we turn on the tap, clean water will come out. Author Charles Fishman says that we are leaving this golden age of abundant, cheap and safe water behind, and thoughtlessly so at that. And he joins us now in studio for more. Here's Charles Fishman, author of The Big Thirst, and it's good to see you up here at TVO in Toronto, Canada. Thank you very much for having me. I home love is being in Toronto. Home is Mexico, eh? so you're yes, a long I, way from I'm home. I'm a long way from home at the moment. I want to start with a, uh, I hope, a rather unusual question. Tell me everything you know about what's inside this glass. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good we have plenty of time. I, I actually love that question. Yeah. The, you know, what I love about picking up a glass of water, now that I've spent five years thinking about water, is that, that this, the stuff in this glass really feels much more magical and interesting to me than it did before I started thinking about water. So the first thing I would say about this water is, this is the only thing you're ever going to encounter in your entire life that looks exactly like it looked four billion years ago when it was delivered to Earth. Amazing. Even rock, marble, granite, all that stuff has been churned through the inside of the Earth and reemerged. Um, this came from space in exactly the condition that it's in now. And it is literally the only stuff that we encounter uh, in the, not just every day, but in the course of our whole lifetimes, that was delivered here looking just like it looks. So in some ways, and, 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 and that, in fact, is something most people don't realize, even, even I didn't realize before I started uh, learning about water, um, all the water on Earth was formed in space and delivered to the planet when the planet was formed or, or a little after it was formed. Uh, there is no mechanism for creating new water on the Earth, so no every, geological mechanism. Everything we drink, use, put it on our lawns, whatever, whatever, goes all the way back to day one. Absolutely, it's and all, we can't it's all original equipment. Oh. So when you so when you worry about when you worry about when people worry about reusing water, should we clean a city's water and reuse it? If if this came from one of the high-end bottled waters like Evian or Fiji water, it's Tyrannosaurus rex pee. It's all dinosaur pee, it's and, and I'll have a sip. <laughs> Tyrannosaurus rex pee. Absolutely. Hopefully the dinosaurs, we clean it up a bit, though. The dinosaurs were here for 150, 200 million years, many, you know, eons longer than human beings. All of the water has been cycled over and over and over again. And, and so that's a reminder that Water is a resource that can't be used up, and I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind when you when you start thinking about water. Although we seem to be doing our best to, I know you've got some great examples in the book, and we'll talk about them. But our attitude today seems quite profligate as it relates to being smart and sensible about how to deal with water. Would you agree? Our, our, our attitude is profligate to the point of complete ignorance. We we actually don't typically think about water very much at all, especially in the developed world. Um, and that's a, that's a really unusual uh, moment for human beings to be living in. Even 100 years ago, across the developed world, you had to think about your water every day. Uh, you had to think about where it was coming from, who was getting it, what condition it was in, whether it was safe or not. And 100, just about 105 years ago, human beings realized that if you filtered water just through a sand bed, just through a, you know, a, 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 a huge tank of sand, and then you added just a little bit of chlorine to it, you instantly rendered the water safe, and you didn't have to worry about its healthfulness anymore. And that discovery, that realization, just a century ago, really transformed uh, our relationship to water. We don't People who live in the modern developed world, people who live in Canada, people who live in the United States, people who live in Australia or Western Europe, don't have any skepticism or hesitation about their water at all. And they never think about it. You just turn on the tap and the water's there. And it's essentially unlimited. No one manages their water at home worried about running out or even worried about the water bill, the way you might worry about your gas bill or Yet. your heating oil bill. Yet. 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 If I have my way, you will, you, will, okay, you will eventually manage your water based on the bill. But that that hundred year period is completely different than the 20,000 years of human civilization that comes before that, when you had to think about water as part of your daily routine. And so we've really reveled in not having to worry about our water. 
And, and we, we owe that to the brilliant engineering, and Toronto is a great example of that, the brilliant engineering of, of folks who, who put in place those systems just 100 years ago. Your book, I have to say, which I really enjoyed, and is filled with numerous examples of um, you know, case studies and, and actually a lot of fun facts, too, about <laughs> things I, that had never occurred to me, and I want to just talk about one of them right now. When the space shuttle takes off, they flood the pad with water. Right. But not for the reason that I thought you flood the pad with water. Right. Tell us why they flood the pad with water, <laughs> and lots of it. Yeah, they, they, they put, they, they, were, they were putting um, uh, the equivalent of four million gallons a minute, something like that, across the pad. And, and just like everybody else, I actually was a Washington Post reporter, so I covered, and I covered the space program for a while as a Washington Post reporter. And, and like everyone else, I've seen the, the water actually starts flooding the pad before the engines are lit and lasts all the way through the launch of the space shuttle. And I assumed it was to keep the pad cool. But in fact, uh, water used in rocket launches is a sound dampening mechanism. The space shuttle is so loud that, and, and the sound is so powerful that the sound waves would reverberate off the concrete launch pad and bounce back and literally rip the space shuttle apart before it could get off the pad if it wasn't for the water. They only launched the space shuttle without water once, and they were sort of horrified at what they had done when they looked at their sound measurements and, and looked at what, what the space shuttle itself had encountered. So that water is used as a sound-absorbing cushion. Mm -hmm. And to the, I actually open the book with that story. Mm -hmm. And the reason I do is because it is a perfect example of how we use water in all of these incredibly creative and imaginative ways that we never take account for and that, and that are sort of testament to the, the flexibility and the nimbleness and the, you know, and literally the value of water. Who would think of... I mean, in, in your ordinary life, you would never think of water as a sound cushion, but it works perfectly. They thought about it at NASA. Let's just uh, dovetail from that to maybe some of the myths that we have about water that uh, you think we need to you know, put a hole in those myths. Like what? Well, I think th there are lots of myths. The, m my favorite myth is that we shouldn't be reusing the water we're already using. So I think, uh, there, especially in the Western world, at the same moment as we started treating our drinking water, we developed good systems for treating wastewater, for treating sewage. And we were taught and learned to keep the drinking water and the wastewater separate, right? You want to take the drinking water from over here and send the wastewater out over there, and you don't want them anywhere near each other. And in fact, in most communities, uh, in most big cities, the, the water supply people, the drinking water people, and the wastewater people are completely separate organizations. They don't, mm. they don't have the same boss. They don't report up the same chain of command. So the water falls from the, from the spigot, the six inches down to the drain, and it literally changes organizations between <laughs> those two things. And to me, one of the biggest myths is that there's something bad about wastewater. In fact, wastewater is a huge asset, a huge resource. And even in a community like Toronto, even in a country like Canada, where, you, where you're almost a sort of waterborne country, you, you know, water is part of your identity. We've got the Great Lakes, honey. You've got the, you've got, proud you've, of got you've got a tiny sliver of the world's population and 20% of the world's fresh water. Yeah. But even you all should be thinking about how you manage and use and reuse wastewater because it's a it's actually an asset. So my number one myth. Uh, and this is this obviously has a lot of power in dry communities is that you should reuse water and i would say especially up north here where there seems to be abundant water i would say that that a, a really urgently important myth is we have a lot of water so we don't need to think about water water is one thing we don't need to worry about we're starting to get a different view on that i think and in fact if after this interview you go across the road from this radio uh, tv station uh, you'll find a building that, a uh, big, I don't know, 50-story condo that was, I guess, completed in the last couple of years where they have thought about that, where they have tanks on the roof and they gather their rainwater and they have thought about reusing it.
Okay, how, great. How fresh a notion is that among people who build buildings, who think about these kinds of things? Because it doesn't sound like something we would have worried about 10 years ago. Well, in a, in a, in a big city like Toronto, uh, it's, it's a very fresh notion, especially a big city built on a huge lake. Uh, ju ju just before coming up here, I actually did the math. Toronto could drink out of Lake Ontario for 1,430 years before the lake would be empty, <laughs> assuming no water flowed back into the lake. Hmm. So, so Lake Ontario is a huge asset and a huge resource. But you're never sorry that you collected the rainwater that falls on your property. And in fact, uh, a, a huge urban area does a lot of damage to the water that falls. You, it, it gets dirty. So if you can collect it right where it falls, before uh, it hits the roads, before it you know, encounters uh, exhaust, uh, all the grit that's on the road, dog poop is a, is a huge polluter, um, and, and use it right in the building, or, or better yet, return it right to the ground so that it ends up where it would have ended up if we hadn't paved, if, if we didn't have uh, concrete and a building here. That's actually really important. Uh, uh, there are lots of, of developing world cities that actually understand this better than the developed world. Delhi, India, for instance, which has uh, terrible water management systems and, a, and, and is kind of a mess in water terms. Uh, residents of Delhi only get water three hours a day. But Delhi requires all new construction to return all the rainwater that falls on the ground back into the aquifer mm. underneath the city. A relatively new rule, but there's no reason every community shouldn't have a rule like that. So I, it's great that that, that that building is doing that. You've, uh, I guess, pointed out that it's basically of the last 100 years that we've really started to get a handle on water treatment and understanding, I think you call it our relationship with water in the book, understanding that different kind of relationship. And I wonder what, what impact did the growth of water treatment and infrastructure have on you know, our society, how we lay out our cities, the whole thing in general? Well, I, I think it's pretty clear that water treatment 100 years ago did two really important things. First, it changed health. It, it, the, the, in the, the numbers in the U.S. are so striking. U.S. life expectancy grew by 25 or 30 years over the course of the first 40 or 50 years of the century. From 1900 to 1950, if you were born in the United States, in, in 1900 you were going to live to 45, and in 1950 you were going to live to 75. So your life expectancy almost doubled over the course of that 40-year period. And the reason is, in, in part, is because water treatment was put in place. So we dramatically reduced uh, infant mortality, and we dramatically reduced waterborne diseases, the kind of diseases that still kill millions of people in the undeveloped world, mm -hmm. uh, around the world. The second thing that that kind of water treatment did was enable big cities. People used to be a little suspicious about the water that was delivered to them with good reason, even in cities like New York, and, and especially in smaller, uh, less financially well-off cities. But but water tr drinking water treatment meant you could supply water to a city not just of 500,000 people, but a city of 5 million people mm -hmm. safely and not worry about endangering them. And so if you were running the city, that was a huge political bonus you had to offer your own citizens. And if you were moving into a city, it was one worry off the list of, of whether it was okay to bring your family to that city to work and earn mm -hmm. a living. And so if you look at the scale of, of cities, it goes up dramatically as soon as clean water supplies could be guaranteed. And yet in this province, we had probably one of the worst scandals of the last quarter century a few years ago now, maybe a, dec a little more than a decade and a half ago or so, when a small community about three hours from here called Walkerton, uh, people turn on the tap like they do every day, and they took a drink of water, and seven people died because the water got contaminated. We are, and I guess this, this goes to the point you make earlier, we are so, uh, I guess, confident or so non-thinking about how good that water supply is going to be here in the industrialized world that we don't realize that we've still got to, we got to keep an eye on this, don't we? Well, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable in part because we trust the water system. I, I know a little bit about the Walkerton example, and, uh, and, and the, those deaths are, are terrible, but... 
in the wake of those people dying from, from E. coli in their water, mm -hmm. there was a huge effort to understand what happened. And the, um, the rules in Ontario changed. And in fact, what had happened was that a small community wasn't paying attention to not the water coming out of the tap, not this, but this comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Where in the environment does it come from? All the water we rely on, the water doesn't come from pipes. Water doesn't come from water treatment plants. Water comes from somewhere in the environment. It comes from a lake or a river or a well. And one of the things that I like to talk about when I talk to groups about water is you have to draw the circle wide enough. Mm. You have to look at where the water is coming from in the first place. And in the case of Walkerton and in many communities, they weren't looking at the intersection of farmers and, and the agricultural world and the settled world. And of course, farms are a huge source of pollution of all kinds in terms of water. They use a huge amount of water. And so it's really important to understand where your water is coming from and to make sure it's safe before it comes out of the tap. Well, let me follow up on that. I started by asking you about this. I now want to ask you about this. <laughs> and because we're public television, we took all the branding off it. But that's bottled water, obviously. And I wonder, how different is this from this? Well, depending on, depending on what the label said before you uh, <laughs> took it off, 24%, a quarter of the bottled water in North America, is just tap water that's put in a bottle and sold to you for your convenience. Coke, Pepsi, and Nestle... Uh, take municipal water in every big community that they sell water in. They run it through filters. They clean the clean water again, and then they put it in a bottle and sell it to you. They run it through the filters because, just like the big fast food companies, they want their brand of bottled water to taste the same in Toronto and Calgary and Seattle and Chicago. Um, so, so in that sense, in many places, there's zero difference, except you could, you, in, a, in a typical community, you could fill this bottle every day for eight years before the tap water would cost you the dollar that it cost you at the convenience store. So that's overpriced. Uh, it, about, it's costing you about 3,000 times what the tap water is costing you. In the U.S., bottled water is actually less well-regulated than tap water, and, and that's true in most of the developed world. So your tap water is typically cleaner and also it's safer in the sense that somebody is always watching the tap water hmm. and bottled water is not monitored nearly as closely. So why are we buying so much of this rather than just drinking this? Well, you know what's interesting is that when people buy, my sense is that when people buy bottled water, it's not about the water, it's about the occasion. So hmm. it's, it's portable, it's convenient, it's cold, uh, it's totable. You can't really get in your car with this. You mm. can't put this in a, you can't put a glass of water in somebody's lunchbox. Now, obviously, there are very easy solutions, right? You can have water bottles. You can fill them. You can tuck them in the refrigerator. But we have really become a very convenience-based culture. So when I, I'm, I'm 51, this product didn't even exist when I was a child. Mm -hmm. it, you literally could not buy it. And, and um, two things sort of, came together to create the bottled water culture uh, across North America. One is this desire for convenience, the desire to move quickly, to take what you want and, and be where you need to be. And the second thing is literally the plastic bottle, which did mm -hmm. not exist in this, in this quality and durability and transparency when we were growing up. There was that sort of fuzzy, milky white plastic that, that, that water sometimes came in. But those two things sort of made it very, very appealing. And I'm not, you know, it's not my job to tell anybody what to drink or what products to use, and I don't. But I did go to Fiji to see where Fiji water came from. Yeah. And I went to San Pellegrino to see where uh, San Pellegrino water comes from. And, and I would say that on most occasions, uh, bottled water is an indulgence. <laughs> it's not a necessity. Let's, uh, in our uh, home stretch here, uh, start to consider what will happen to our world if we don't start to take this stuff seriously. Uh, Australia, Atlanta, Venezuela, Barcelona. You give some examples in this book of places which are, you know, they are really starting to have to think hard. Well, they, water, they water dependent and, and also water star and losing yeah. it. That's right. Yes. So, what are the what are the consequences if we don't get our act together here? Well, and you know, Atlanta is a good example because Atlanta is, seems like a water flush area, the way Canada thinks of itself as. And yet, 
Um, three or four years ago, Atlanta came within 80 days of running out of water. Atlanta is a city of five million people. It, every truck in the United States of America could not supply enough of this to keep Atlanta in water. So it's not, there's, no, there's no comparison between a municipal water system and bottled water. And, and the attitude in Atlanta was, oh, it'll rain. And that's not a great attitude. So there are lots of places that are accustomed to abundant water. And the truth is that climate change is not shifting the amount of water there is. We're not losing the water itself. But we've built our cities in particular places, mm. assuming uh, a quanti we, we built them where there has been water available in some way. Climate change is, is changing where the water's falling. And one of the remarkable things is how, how small changes in what falls result in huge changes in what's available. So a, a great example is Perth, Australia, where they've been measuring uh, rainfall for more than 100 years. Their rainfall has, has dropped 20% in the last 25 years but the water flowing into their reservoirs fell 75%. Hmm. Because the reservoirs were in place to collect the water that a huge city needs. So a small change in what happens in the environment can dramatically affect huge cities. And so that's why I'm, what I think we should be doing is imagining a future where there's less water available than we have now, and then trying to re-envision what we're doing every day to take account of that. But I think, if I read this right, tell me, the, uh, the difference in approach that I think you think we ought to take is that unlike global warming, which is going to require you know, national, international, continent-wide solutions, the solutions to this are all local, aren't they? Well, I, th I think this is probably the most important, maybe going all the way back to the beginning, probably the most important myth. We hear all the time about the global water crisis. But there is no global water crisis. There are a thousand local water crises. And only the community that is having the water problem can tackle that problem. If Toronto and Ontario clean up Lake Ontario, then it's clean. Hmm. Misbehavior in Barcelona or Beijing cannot undo that solution. By the same token, it doesn't matter what they do in Beijing if you all don't tackle your water problem. So the good news about water problems, in fact, is that they are local. If you decide as a city, as a community, to tackle and fix your water problem, then you, first of all, can fix it, and second of all, no one can undo the fix. The flip side is no one's going to rescue you. you right. Only you, only the community having the problem can fix it. But that, that makes it completely different from the, economic, the global economic downturn, for instance, where everybody in Ontario could pay their mortgage and pay their credit card bills on time, as they should, and still the whole province can be hurt by decisions made in New York and London and Reykjavik. Water isn't like that. Water, water is the kind of thing that you can and need to solve locally. Uh, which means that we had better get a focus on this, right? We'd better get our act together. We need to pay attention to it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Why? It almost always takes a crisis for people to act, right? We just seem to be that kind of a species. <laughs> so are, is it literally going to be the case where one day we're going to have to turn the tap and nothing comes out before our decision makers decide, oh, my goodness, we've kind of screwed this up? Right. Well, there's another, there's another feature of water which doesn't lend itself to that, to that approach, which is almost all water problems can be solved community by community, but they can't be solved tomorrow. They can't be solved by you know, a month from today. They can't even be solved in a year. You have to change water habits slowly over time. And, and so that's what Las Vegas has done. That's what Orlando, Florida has done. Uh, you have to grab hold and imagine how you want water used to be 10 years from now. So if we wait until the crisis is upon us, there will be a lot of pain. I mean, that's, you know, that's one of the things I learned in Australia. They endured a 10-year drought, a 10-year long drought like the drought the U.S. sort of has gone through in the last year. Well, you can't, you can't recover from a 10-year drought in the middle of a drought. You have to adapt your whole society to that and change your habits permanently. And so I hope we don't wait for the crisis. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.